so we'll go ahead and get started on the meeting here. Um, we can get started. Do we want to do roll call? Okay. All right. We'll start with the labor since, okay, so Scott is here. Matt, we see you online. Good morning. And Jill. Good morning. That's, and Marcy. Good morning. And Scott is here in person, and Margaret is here virtually. Good morning. Let's see. Okay, so management, Tamia. Here. Yeah. And Sarah is here. Uh, John, in case you're on the phone. And Lynn, I see you're square. Good morning. Yeah. And Patrick is here as well, virtually. And Andrew is here in the, in the, the, the conference room. So we do have quorum. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and get started with a review of minutes from May 19th and June 16th meetings. I think that's okay. Actually, I'm going to ask Patrick. Did you, Patrick, did you want to request the, the, uh, the, the agenda change now, or do you want to wait until after the minutes? Or? I can ask for the agenda change now. I, uh, uh, I can ask for the agenda Follow the uh, discussion of, or before the, the discussion of the minutes, to be the first item on the agenda. So, for those of you following, uh, the, the item is the, the thought is to change the last item on the agenda, the appointment of subcommittee, uh, to the top of the agenda. So, as I say, Co Chair Strickland, if you're okay with that, we can. Make that change in. Yeah, I'm okay with okay. that. Is there any objection from any of the MLAC members on here virtually, or any questions or discussion about that? Hearing and seeing none. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. We can shift that up. Thank you. So. Doing that, I guess the, the first issue for committee discussion and action items, uh, discussion about a potential change to bylaws regarding approval of committee minutes. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Crusher. Uh, I will go into a de little detail about that when we get do the adoption of the minutes. Um, uh, but uh, from doing research on Robert's rules, um, no bylaw change is necessary. As the current bylaw state the specific ta items in which a, a majority of both uh, caucuses have to vote. So because it's not, because the minute adoption is not specifically explicitly listed, it would be simple majority. And according to the FAQ of Robert's rules in the most recent edition, an abstention vote is is not it's you know it's actually it's considered an oxymoron um it would be considered a vote for purposes of quorum um and in considering the majority of membership but it does not constitute a no vote unless the bylaw was changed and there was a specific definition of what that is so i think it's probably easiest just to keep it as is and we can make it when we when the time when the need be we'll make it and mention in the minutes in regards to the abstention vote okay I think that's good enough for me. Are there any questions uh, or further discussion on that item? I would just like to thank uh, Ms. Van Winkle for her research on the topic. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm not seeing any others. I'll, I'll give a little extra time. I know with folks being virtual, sometimes it's hard to find the raise hand function or to figure out how to unmute yourself. So apologies for the extra long pauses, but uh, we'll, we'll push through, I'm sure. Um, so second uh, item then is the appointment of subcommittee. Yes, so I guess just to tee it off, just a refresher from um, in regards to the bylaws, in regards to appointment of the subcommittee. Um, it does not, does a vote from the committee itself does, is not necessary. It is an appointment from the co-chairs. Um, the official announcement of the subcommittee itself can be done via notice that's not required. Um, I know that we want to discuss and hash, you know, basic items out here today, but the official announcement and such can be done through gov delivery and we will do that. Um, when the when the time comes for that, um, also two um, non voting there has to be you know I think it was agreed upon there'll be one equal members of man management and labor to be official members of the committee, um, but any committee member can attend the subcommittees, um, and also non voting public members can be appointed to the subcommittee, and we can discuss that further yep. this morning. 
Yeah, so I guess to kind of dovetail off of that, I, I know that we had discussed, um, I, I believe last time, uh, how we would want to structure the subcommittee and, and the number of members involved. And it's my understanding that we'd agreed that maybe just having one from, from each side uh, would help a lot with the scheduling issues and, and other things to, to have the subcommittee, you know, the formal members. <clears throat> but then, uh, obviously open invitation to anyone who wants to attend or is able to attend those subcommittee meetings to attend and participate both MLAC members but also stakeholders and other groups. Um, were there any kind of discussions or questions about that? Uh, at, at least the structure of the committee initially and then we can get into some of the other questions of, uh, of, of you know, what the charge would be and, and the timeline and all of that. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, the, the management co-chair, uh, Patrick Priest, and I support that um, composition of one from each side and uh, would just open it up if there was anyone in, in my caucus that wants to, to we talked about it offline, but could certainly speak up. I think we support that and have identified a, a uh, caucus member that has volunteered to serve as, as that one person. And I believe we, we've done the same with some discussions offline and, and have a member as well that would be interested in participating. Uh, any any questions or uh, discussion for the MLAC members about that or, or further comments on, on just this initial discussion? Not seeing any. Um, so what are, the, you know, structurally we've gone over kind of how we can structure the committee and whatnot, what are the other issues that we would need to know or discuss relating to establishing the committee? Um, I just say, maybe, Mr. Crutcher, I don't know how far you want to go into like the, what, the, what the scope of the subcommittee would be. I should point out, too, that the, um, the subcommittee meetings are subject to Oregon public meeting law, so there will be the proper notification. There will also be the ability to watch, uh, to observe, and participate as well you know, you know, via public meetings. Um, my only suggestion is probably to help with, I guess, continuity and more flow is that perhaps they, they can be virtual just in nature only. Um, what we can do is we will provide the, a room um, to, for people if they so choose to be here with, with me <laughs> and, and uh, Kara and team um, to officially run the meeting, but, but there's that too. Um. I, I think that sounds good, especially the the virtual format. Um, any any questions about that or discussion or concerns? No. Um, I know you know Patrick had had some questions about kind of the scope or the the purpose of the subcommittee. Um, that and that there was probably a little more you wanted to say on that, Patrick. Sure. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. I. Um, I think the charge of the committee is is following through with the um, previous actions by MLAC when there was a recommendation made to um, support House Bill 4138. Is that correct? Is that the number? Yes. Yes. If I have that right. I, thank you, Teresa. Um, and it was to um, explore further the uh, workers. Uh, continuity of care, connection to care, and specifically, you know, how long someone, uh, an injured worker, could go without having a doctor's appointment and, and still receive benefits. So, you know, it's the essential question. And last time, last month's meeting, there was some discussion of access to care being one of the reasons why you couldn't, you know, have a doctor's visit. And I think that the, the purpose of this particular subcommittee should really be on following through on uh, the leftover items from House Bill 4138, and uh, and as ac access to care relates to that particular charge, I think they could be part of the discussion and part of the consideration. But I think access to care itself is a larger issue that warrants its own subcommittee, and and is even larger than work comp, you know, in general. I mean, I think that's a healthcare issue in general. But, um, so I would just ask that the the scope of the subcommittee's work be focused 
on uh, continuation of care. So kind of the primary purpose or concern and what, what the subcommittee is primarily dealing with is uh, you said continuity of care, um, that there may be sort of other issues that are directly related to that that are discussed, but that this be more narrowly tailored. Is that correct? That is correct. My own request, and I invite others in my, my caucus to, to check in if they want. I, I don't see a problem with kind of more, you know, having a direct question or a more direct issue. Um, like you identified, I think that there are a lot of these issues that will sort of necessarily bubble up that are directly related to it, but that closing the scope, the, the main purpose to, to focus on that issue, um, I, I don't see a problem with that. Any other comments or, or ideas or concerns from MLAC members? Uh, I see uh, Sarah Duckwall. Thank you, Chair Strickland. I would also like a timeline to uh, come from the direction of MLAC so we can uh, focus and stay within MLAC's direction on time. And I guess I, I have a, I appreciate that. Um, I have maybe a quick, I see uh, uh, Marcy as well. I have a quick, and Lynn, um, a quick question for Teresa, kind of procedurally. Mm -hmm. When these subcommittees under the new rules are formed, um, is there sort of a, a singular deadline or there may be time on the meetings to sort of check back in or report back? You, you can do that, ongoing. Mr. Co-Chair, yes. Um, the bylaws do express that if you both agreed, the co-chairs agree, you can do an end date. So for example, like have the, you know, the subcommittee with a deadline of providing a final report, if you will, to the full committee. So that's the could, only thing that's explicit in the bylaws, but everything else, you, yes, it can be. Okay. So we could have kind of ongoing reports with mm -hmm. a deadline mm -hmm. at the end. Okay. Um, and I saw, uh, Marcy, I saw you, you had your hand up, but put it down. Did that, was that the question that you had? Uh, no, I just wanted to make a comment and say that um, I think it's important that we limit, um, limit scope creep. And so any parameters that we can put around and be respectful both of the intent and the members who are serving great that's thank you and i see lynn's hand and then i see margaret so uh lynn uh, thank you scott uh, i agree with what marcy said and what has been discussed so far about limiting the scope you know if something bubbles up to the point that it needs further discussion you can always have another subcommittee okay and I see Margaret. Scott, have you and uh, Patrick had an opportunity to uh, uh, draft a purpose or a, a scope of what the committee is looking at and what the MLAC as a whole is looking for from the committee? We don't have any draft. Uh, purpose yet it, it's my understanding and please anyone jump in and correct me if I'm wrong that uh, we you know we can have this discussion and then get together on that uh, prior to making the announcement uh, through what was the system we um, via like a memo an official announcement in which we yeah. can send out through gov delivery and of course I'm like members you would get that in advance and I've depending on your caucus coach I you know I'm not I don't want to speak on behalf of either of you the, the, the opportunity for offline feedback to before it's officially published. Yeah, Scott, I just think that we need to be really clear about what the purpose is and what the scope is before, because if we don't have agreement on that, there's never going to be a good outcome from the committee. I agree. Mr. Chair, this is, this is Patrick Priest uh, with a, a comment as well. Sure. So I, as my, as I understand it, and I will call on um, one of the management stakeholders, Elaine Schooler from SAFE, to um, speak to the fact that there is draft language for a bill, like edits to a bill, that could be a starting point for consideration uh, by the subcommittee. Uh, yes, good morning, um, Elaine Schooler. 
the state corporation. We do have language that was circulated at the time of House Bill 4138 when that was in discussions, and we can provide that to the members. Um, however, I think what was requested was a um, purpose statement, something that sets up guardrails. Not sure that the um, prior language would necessarily define what those guardrails are or should be for the subcommittee. Um, that's material that we can provide and, and can be discussed throughout the, this process. And that, yeah, I think that, that would be helpful if we could get kind of any stakeholder input on, on that and, and what was discussed uh, so that when, when we get the, the memo issued that we can make sure that we're taking all of that into consideration um, and, and clearly kind of stating what the scope is. And, and as the concerns have been listed by other members, uh, you know, properly limiting the scope with, a, with an appropriate timeline. Um, I, I guess I would ask too, are there, is there any discussion on timeline, uh, you know, what, what would be uh, doable or desired? I see Margaret's hand and I see Sarah's hand as well. Margaret, did you mean to? I see Margaret's put her hand down. Uh, Sarah, step wall. Thank you, Chair Strickland. Um, you know, I, I think the 825 meeting we could use as a, a, a first meeting for the subcommittee and kind of use that as the back story, the background story, and what we need to move forward, kind of the, um, the problem solving statement um, generated there with the next couple meetings as status updates. Um, I think November would be a good opportunity to uh, have something final in place if, if we feel that that is a reasonable expectation of the committee. Do we have any, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a good, you know, uh, suggestion. Do we have any other feedback from other MLAC members? Are there any major plans, you know, everybody planning on going on vacation for all of August or, or September or any of that? Um, Stakeholders, I'm sure that there's lots of stakeholders that will be interested and involved in this. So is there any feedback on dates or what would or wouldn't be uh, feasible? No, no discussion, no other suggestion in order to allow for other meetings would we want to say sort of middle end of November When do we meet for unlock in November um, it's currently November the 10th so perhaps I'm just think just thinking out loud here to go off of Sarah's suggestion is that so the target date could be the October 20th meet you know, um, to have the subcommittee wrap up recommendations or if there's outstanding issues there's a little bit of wiggle room for the subcommittee and then the, the subcommittee can do the presentation and wrap in the full committee wrap things up at the November 10th meeting so sort of a, a deadline to present the findings to mm -hmm. us of November 10th mm -hmm. I think that's, I, I feel like that would be a reasonable suggestion. I, I think once we uh, have a discussion with, with who's going to be on the committee and, and they're able to maybe look at some times to meet uh, with that in mind, we could, we could verify that. Any other questions or, or discussion or thoughts about this topic? Kind of more broadly or generally.
Come on, everybody. It's only Thursday. We can't be half asleep yet. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff, I guess one more procedural thing. Would the co-chairs get together then and draft the memo based on our conversations and timelines today and present that to the, or provide that to the subcommittee as our charge? Yes, it's mm -hmm. my understanding that that's how that would work. Yep, and then we will also have a subcommittee webpage presented, and so this information, the memo, the you know the time, the current time frames, um, will also be put published there as well for people for reference. Great. Any any other questions? Give it a minute. Uh, again, any other feedback or, or questions or concerns or support from stakeholders? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for their, their feedback on that. I feel like that was a, a productive discussion. Um, so moving on next, we have, uh, if I'm correct, we want to go back to the reviewing of, mm -hmm. of meeting minutes now? Yes. So we have the May 19th minutes. So the, uh, starting with the May 19th minutes, uh, review uh, any questions or discussion about that I'd entertain a motion to approve this is Marcy mm -hmm. I move that we approve the minutes for May 19th second uh, we have a motion and a second uh, any discussion uh, all those in favor Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. No. Um, then we have the June 16th minutes as well. Yes, so the June 16th minutes now. Uh, I see Tammy. Wait, wait a second. Yeah, wait a second. Are we supposed to also ask if anybody is seen uh, at that time? Yes. Oh. yes, thank you. Yes, All right, so we will we will do the revote on that. that. Okay. Is there any of the members would you like to do an abstention vote on the on the May nineteenth minutes? Did you say abstain? What did you say? An, abstain? Abstain, an abstention vote. Is an abstention vote and a, a yes. abstaining from voting because I abstain from voting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Thank you. That, that's what that would be. Yes, sir. I think she's saying abstention, Tammy. It's harder oh, to hear her. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I thought she was saying extension. Oh, sorry. Her. No, I will okay, repeat. Thank you. Okay, I'll repeat. And I'll go slower. The members, do our, would any of you like to vote to abstain? Yeah, and what's called an abstention vote. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Procedurally, do you know? Do I need to revote the whole thing, or we can just I will. I will ask again. Uh, just to be on this. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so I, what we'll do on the record is that Tammy, Tammy will change. Tammy's vote changed from I to an abstention vote, and so it, it maintains everybody else's I vote. So now we will consider okay, the June. Never voted I. <laughs> so we will now go to the June sixteenth <laughs> minutes. Okay. Thank okay. you, Tammy, for speaking up. Yes. So. Oh, uh, go on. We're done. <laughs> Uh, June sixteenth vote or, or uh, minutes. Uh, any kind of questions or, or issues before we get into that? So I, I'd entertain a motion to approve those. I move to approve those. Does Patrick I would second? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and do we have any members that want to vote, do an abstention vote? Okay, we have Lynn. Okay. I wasn't present, so I want to abstain. Okay. Okay, so the minister still approved. I should also point out too, and I'll send a, mem um, a reminder of this to you members as well. Part of my research in Roberts, you can, if even if you did not attend the meeting, if you see a typo or something that you would like to amend the minutes with, you can do that. 
So for whatever that's worth down the line, you can do that as well. Yep. And any opposed? None. Thank you, Tammy, for that. We'll need to. I'll need to change my uh, my progression there. <laughs> uh, so I believe next up on the agenda are the department updates, uh, starting with the rulemaking update. Yes. So there, uh, the workers' compensation division has a number of advisory committee meetings happening uh, this uh, in August. Um, first, on August 9th at 9 a.m., there is a hybrid meeting um, in regards to amendments to OAR 436-035, which is disability rating standards. Um, also, in, sept in August, um, there will be an advisory committee meeting um, on August 24th at 1.30. Again, hybrid meeting. Um, amendments to OAR 436-050, um, insurer coverage, um, in employer, excuse me, employer insurer coverage responsibility. And last but certainly not least, actually tied into the subcommittee conversation, um, there's an advisory committee meeting on September the 7th at 1.30, hybrid meeting in regards to implementation of House Bill 4138 and House Bill uh, 2040, um, just amendment of rules there. Um, for all three of these um, advisory committee meetings, the agenda is pending and will be delivered via Gov Delivery when, when it becomes available um, there. Um, also shifting gears, um, the Division of Financial Regulation has um, had a rulemaking meeting uh, on the this week um, in regards to um, revisions um, for, um, for this Oregon statistical plan for workers' compensation and, or, and employers' liability insurance. So to refresh memories, um, while the Workers' Compensation Division is the regulator for the workers' compensation system, the Division of Financial Regulation um, oversees carriers themselves and also, uh, to a certain extent, some functions of uh, third-party administrators there. Um, and so this actually kind of ties into, um, kind of gives a bridge between rulemaking and actually uh, Todd Johnson's presentation about um, NCCI and what they do, because this is one of the areas in which uh, DCBS relies upon their expertise to carry out our functions. And so that is all I've got in regards to that. Um, so the other, the other item under the department updates is case law updates for the Workers' Compensation Board. So. As they, as they come to the witness table. This is kind of our debut members. This is the first you've asked for this, just kind of an overview of um, major cases that have gone through the adjudication process and the opportunity for you all to ask questions about, about those cases. Yeah, uh, hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Robert Arvington. I'm the, uh, well, technically, I'm the uh, interim managing attorney at the Workers' Comp Board right now. Uh, and this is Lauren Eldridge. She is our, one of our senior staff attorneys. Jim no longer help me. And um, if I could just uh, modify, I guess, the introduction just to state that we we really specifically came to address a, a, a member's um, question about a specific Supreme Court case, uh, Johnson v. Safe, that we were uh, asked to present on it. So we're, and we had to um, tie along with that, um, we're going to be talking about Robinette v. Safe, which is a tandem case. Um, and, um, but of course, if anyone has questions about any other case, we'd be happy to respond, um, you know, uh, to the best of our ability or follow up, you know, with you via email, um, et cetera. Um, so, but I just wanted to say that in general, we're going to be presenting on those two very recent uh, Supreme Court cases. So, anyway, here's Lauren for okay. Johnson Music. All <laughs> right, so these cases are interesting. They, um, were decided by the Court of Appeals on the same day and uh, petitioned for review as companion cases, consolidated for oral argument. Um, Supreme Court actually released one several weeks earlier than the other. Johnson versus SAFE was the first to be issued. So I'm going to discuss that first and then Robert's going to go over Robinette and we can talk about some of the distinctions between the two, why they resulted in different outcomes, and um, answer any questions that anybody might have. Okay, so starting with Johnson, the injured worker in this case was a housekeeper. She was injured at work when her left hand was caught in a closing elevator door. So she filed a workers' compensation claim related to that injury with SAFE, and SAFE accepted left finger contusions and a left finger abrasion. Um, during the treatment for her finger conditions, 
claim it, it was discovered that she also had a left shoulder injury, a tear in one of her tendons. She accept, uh, requested acceptance of that condition from SAFE, but SAFE denied that condition on the basis that it wasn't causally related to the work injury. Uh, the worker didn't appeal that denial, that denial became final. Um, so back to the accepted left finger conditions, those conditions became medically stationary, meaning they weren't likely to improve with further medical treatment. So SAFE appropriately closed the claim. And in the initial closure, SAFE did not award any permanent impairment. Um, claimant disputed the lack of a permanent impairment award, so a medical arbiter was appointed. And the medical arbiter found that the claimant had some loss of grip strength in her left hand. The arbiter attributed 50% of the loss of grip strength to the accepted left finger conditions, and then 50% to the denied left shoulder condition. Um, based on that arbiter opinion, claimant was awarded permanent impairment for the loss of grip strength. However, the um, appellate re review unit at for the workers' compensation division and then the workers' compensation board both determined that it was appropriate for the impairment award to be apportioned to reflect that only 50% of the loss of grip strength was attributable to the accepted left finger conditions. So um, the worker appealed that determination, and this case made it all the way up to the Oregon Supreme Court. The Supreme Court disagreed with the appellate review unit and the board and determined that apportionment of the impairment award was not appropriate in this case. So the court started its analysis discussing the definition, statutory definition of impairment. Um, and the court reiterated that impairment is the loss of use or function of a body part due in material part to the compensable injury. Here, the accepted left finger conditions. Um, reviewing its prior cases, the statutory scheme, and then also some legislative changes made in 1990, the court determined that the general rule for purposes of impairment is that a worker is entitled to the full measure of an impairment value when the impairment as a whole is due in material part to the accepted condition, even if a portion of that impairment value is attributable to a condition not causally related to the work injury. Here, the denied condition. So the court acknowledged that in 1990, the legislature had created what it described as a limited statutory exception to that general rule. And that exception allows for apportionment in the combined condition context, meaning that there is a statutory pre-existing condition that combines with the accepted condition. And then the carrier follows the statutory process for accepting and then later denying that combined condition. Then the carrier may apportion the impairment award to reduce by the value that is attributable to the pre-existing condition. Um, but in the absence of that exception being applicable, the general rule applies. So turning to the facts of the case in front of it, the court, this was not really disputed, but the court noted that the um, loss of grip strength was due in material part to the accepted left finger conditions. And so the general rule applied. Moving to whether the exception applied, the court noted that the parties agreed there was no combined condition here. So the exception didn't apply. The court agreed that the record supported that position, said the exception did not apply. Um, so the court finally, SAFE made an argument that awarding impairment partially attributable to the denied condition was inconsistent with the overall statutory scheme because generally benefits, workers' compensation benefits, are not awardable for denied conditions. Uh, the court responded to that by saying, by acknowledging that in a little bit of foreshadowing of Robinette, which you'll hear about in a minute, um, that if the impairment was attributable solely to a denied condition, then no impairment would be awardable. However, um, in a, the court thought that in these particular circumstances, limiting the impairment to that 
impairment that is solely related to the accepted condition would be inconsistent with the standard that the impairment need only be due in material part as a whole to the accepted condition. So in conclusion, the court determined that claimant was entitled to the full measure of the loss of grip strength in this case, including the portion of that loss of grip strength that was attributable to the denied condition. Um, the court remanded to the board for further proceedings consistent with its decision. And just, uh, just to note, the board's decision on remand in that case issued actually earlier this week. So if you want to read it, it's on the board's website, I think as of Tuesday. And that is Maricela Johnson, 74 Veneta, 513. Um, so. Okay, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, did anyone have any questions on Johnson in particular? I know that was a specific case that had prompted a, an invitation uh, you know, for us today. Okay, well then moving on to uh, Robinette v. Safe. These cases were, I think, um, uh, joined uh, for decision at the uh, Supreme Court, but then um, they were not, uh, they were in fact argued on the same day, but then the decisions were a few months apart. Rob Robinette v. Safe issued on June 3rd, 2022. Um, and I, if I could just back up just for a second to the um, after effects of Karen v. Providence and Johnson v. Safe is that there have been lots of follow up cases both at the court and at the board, and they've generally just followed along. And if the impairment is material related, re materially related to the compensable injury, then the claimant gets the entire amount of the impairment. Um, now, the impairment still must be related in some part. Um, so if you have the medical arbiter or other uh, attending physician say, look, this uh, uh, worker, let's say, has a loss of range of motion in their uh, ankle. However, this is just not related in any part. It's related zero um, to the compensable injury. Then, of course, you don't get any impairment, which is only fair. Now, creative claimants attorneys have argued, uh, to the board at least, that um, if you have a compensable claim and some kind of compensable condition, then automatically the impairment is materially related. Uh, you know, uh, just kind of, it follows you, but that's all that the only hoop you need to, to, to jump through. Uh, but the board has rejected that argument uh, in several cases. Uh, for example, in old, for example, Anthony J. Dasis, D-A-S-I-S, 74 Vietnam 319, that's from earlier this year, 2022. Um, so there is a limit, it's not just, um, Know, you get in the door with a compensable claim and then everything that the doctor notices on exam is automatically awarded. Now, coming to Robinette, um, this uh, woman was a school custodian and she injured her right knee. Uh, that was accepted for right hip, right knee, and right thigh strength. It was that the claim was enclosed and the uh, arbiter said, well, um, she does have a, a loss of range of motion and decreased stability in the knee, but this is related entirely to pre-existing conditions, 100%. Oh, by the way, she also had a surgery, which gets a value, uh, presumably, and a chronic condition, um, which are materially related to uh, the injury. Um, so, therefore, the court had the opportunity to determine if you must meet this material relationship standard with regard to each particular loss of use or function. In Johnson, it was, you know, it just didn't come up because there was one loss of use or function. It was just grip strength. Um, but in Robinette, um, <clears throat> the court said, well, what we're going to do is say that and this is an arguable, arguable departure from the Karen principle that you get the impairment quote as a whole, uh, but that each, the court said in Robinette says that each distinct loss of use or function is still subject to the material uh, cause standard. The court noted that in the um, you know, department's 035 disability standard rules, uh, losses of use and function are carefully laid out and segregated uh, for, for instance, loss of range of motion, uh, you know, stability, um, et 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then that it was you know um, provided some uh, uh, you know the, of their reasoning to segregate out this re requirement for each individual impairment. And they citing a, an amicus brief, they gave the example of say you have reduced range of motion in your knee that's noticed, but they are to say hey you also have this leg length discrepancy, but you know, frankly, you've had that all your life. That's not due to the injury. Um, so um, the court actually relied heavily, I believe, on policy for the, the decision. And they just said it's just not fair to uh, for the insurer to compensate a claimant um, for something that is just entirely unrelated uh, to the injury. And that goes, squares with the overall policy of incorporating only those costs that are justifiably integrated into stream of commerce um, because they are due to workloads. So um, that's basically Robinette. Uh, it started to poke some uh, holes or, or um, I guess, uh, provide a, at least one exception to this general rule for Karen and Johnson, uh, Cruz, Salazar, some other cases that have just, um, you know, given the entire um, impairment to the planet. I, I do see a question. Are you willing to take it? Uh, certainly, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sarah, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you. I appreciate the explanation of these cases, so thank you for that. Uh, but my, my question is, do we um, have any any sense of what makes it material relatable? Uh, is it a percentage base, so that 50% maybe being what throws it over to make it material relatable for the 100% impairment? Or is it different in each case? Or what should we expect in the future? That's that's a really good question. Um, material has never been, there have been people who have ventured to guess, but there's never been a percentage uh, allocated to it. Some people have said, oh, it means 10% or you know 5% or something. But it's um, in compensability cases, it's been defined as more than a minimal cause, a substantial cause, but certainly not 50%. Uh, I hope that starts to answer your question. But yeah, that's never been codified in either rule or case law or in, that you've seen, no. So it's, but it's generally um, in plain language, uh, you know, more if a substantial cause, more than a minimal cause, but not up to 50%. That would be major cause. like no other questions. Okay, yet. no other yeah. questions. Okay, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, did you have more? I, I don't no, know I, I that, that was part way through. That was, well, I, I, I was going to mention, I guess, if we have time, um, just one permutation that possibly could make its way um, uh, through the, the courts. But uh, we had a case, uh, Guadalupe Cervacio, Cervacio maybe? 74 Vanetta, 65 from earlier this year, 2022, um, in which uh, the board awarded the uh, the whole uh, the full measure of impairment for um, impairment that was found to be materially related to a strain, but they noted that the board noted that um, they had a newly accepted, not yet closed out condition. Actually, two conditions, I believe, infra infraspinatus and supraspinatus tears, to which the impairment was also materially related. That's the thing about material causes that you can have more than one material cause. Uh, it's not theoretically possible if you have two major causes, but you can have two material causes. So the question becomes, what happens when that new condition is closed out? Does the claimant get that impairment as well? And I think theoretically, but um, probably not as a fairness matter and as perhaps a matter of offset in the 436.03b5 rules. Um, you know, it's just kind of a hard, straight face argument to say that the amount that you've already been awarded should be awarded again, um, you know, for the same exact impairment. So, but we may see that issue. So, uh, in general, we're happy to present um, on cases um, even without a specific question. So, we'll try to come by periodically and, and you know, present just the latest cases uh, for the benefit of members. So, thanks. Great. Thank you. And Teresa, do you have contact information in case yes. uh, members have follow-up questions mm -hmm. or anything? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much.
So I see next on the agenda we have uh, Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences annual report and update. Uh, I'm a professor and director of the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences uh, at Oregon Health and Science University. I'm here today to uh, present uh, some recent uh, updates on our institute, um, the financial picture, and also some highlights of our activities. I recognize that the uh, MLAC board is uh, I haven't seen us present for a few years, and there's probably we're, we're new to many of you. So I'm going to hopefully give you some structure, background uh, that you that will, you will find useful. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So we have four presentations today. My presentation is just the institute overview, and then we have two research presentations. One about combating the obesity epidemic. Uh, which will be a fascinating story about how DNA repair that happens in all of our cells uh, throughout our body um, is a mechanism which might be related to obesity, and this can be modulated up, meaning increasing obesity, and down, meaning decreasing obesity. Uh, and that will be uh, Professor Stephen Lloyd who, who presents that, who is actually the former interim director of our institute. Um, uh, then we'll have uh, our newest uh, faculty member, Nicole Bowles, talk about the impact of work schedule on firefighters' health. Um, this is one of about eight projects that Nicole does, and it's a fascinating detail of, uh, if you look on paper, how firefighters have to stay off day and night and, and perform, and it just looks impossible. I've studied sleep research for th over 30 years, and on paper it doesn't look right. It, look, it looks difficult, but by shifting, uh, by comparing uh, sleep schedules and different, different work schedules, uh, it does seem possible and, and these firefighters are, are, are actually thriving uh, with certain uh, work schedule shifts. And then finally, I would like to introduce our new director of outreach, Eric Flynn, who is, we're really delighted to have recruited. Uh, she's a former executive director of the Portland Innovation Quadrant and served for eight years as the Associate Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Portland State University. Next slide, please. So our institute uh, was formed over 30 years ago. It's formerly known as CROIT, the Center for Research on Occupational and Environmental Toxicology. We changed the name, I think, in 2014 to reflect more about what we actually do. The institute is dedicated to health and safety in the workplace. Our mission is to promote wellness and prevent disease and disability among working Oregonians. And we fulfill that mission through basic research and applied research, outreach and education. And I'll explain what I mean by basic research on the, ne on the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, this might be small for some of you to read, um, but hopefully you can download this package uh, as a PDF. Um, our, our, we have 13 full-time faculty members and they all have run their own what's called lab, although there's a great deal of collaboration among the faculty members, both within the institute and across OHSU and actually across the nation. Um, and uh, on the left-hand side of this, on, on the panel, we see the basic researchers. Uh, there are six basic research labs and I've highlighted uh, Dr. Lloyd's uh, lab because he's going to present just uh, one example of one of the projects he's, he's doing. Next is the clinical and, re and applied research, uh, which is, is essentially work in, in at OHSU in the uh, studying humans in specialized laboratories, human volunteers, and then outside in the workforce. Um, and part of the uh, that we have more researchers studying uh, clinical and applied research, and we are currently recruiting two more basic researchers to, to increase that, uh, improve that balance. Uh, part of the applied research, we have we have two large programs. One is called the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. I'll talk about that later. 
um, and another is the Oregon Fatality Assessment and Control Evaluation, where occupational fatalities in Oregon are examined, uh, investigated, and um, assessed, and, and inf informative outreach is offered based on those fatalities. Um, part of the structure is our outreach and education. Um, as I mentioned, Erin Flynn will be talking about that later, and we have an administration that helps us put our grants in and, and run, our, run our building. This is an absolutely unique um, institute. To have basic and applied and clinical research and outreach in one institute, which is a relatively small institute, uh, to cover that breadth is, is amazing. And the fact that we all interact means that the basic basic research informs the clinical research, which informs the applied research, and the applied research helps um, form the questions that the basic researchers um, study. So it is just amazing that, that we, uh, I, I feel that we have this opportunity to interact at all those different levels within one institute. Um, we also get involved in a lot of education uh, as, as well. Next slide, please. The research of those 14 faculty members is, is generally grouped into these four themes. One is called Total Work at Health, and um, we'll probably present about that next time, but in, in essence it is a combined safety and health promotion interventions in the workforce. Next is Sleep and Shift Work, and Nicole Bowles is going to talk a little bit about that, of the impact on health and safety uh, of that theme. But we have lots of researchers studying sleep um, and shift work and circadian rhythms. Um, we, we have researchers studying circadian rhythms in fruit flies, in mice, in humans in the lab, and in, in human, humans in, in the workforce. Uh, the next is injury treatment, recovery, and prevention. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, uh, the fatality assessment and control evaluation program. We have people studying traumatic brain injury, uh, safety climates, etc. We're not going to talk too much about that today. And then the final theme is called exposure biology, uh, and specifically the role of the genome instability in human disease. And uh, Dr. Lloyd will present that today, some of that today. Next slide, please. Um, this is our income. The orange part of the pie chart is the funds, the, the very valuable state funds that come to our institute. Um, over uh, $3 million in uh, 2021. And that helps us run, a, run a, all of our basic core programs and, and our administration and pays off uh, half of the faculty's salaries, the, half the salaries of the faculty members. And it helps us leverage into getting actually uh, almost twice as many funds from federal grants, which is the blue panel. So I feel this is a very successful model um, where the state funds help bring in um, twice as many uh, federal funds. These federal funds are really tough to get. Uh, for example, for, they usually come from the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we apply for grants. In general, um, these, are, these grants are only funded between 10 and 20% of the time. So if you think the average of that is 15, then, then on average, you have to put in about six applications to get one funded. We're, our batting average is much better than that. Um, and all of our faculty members bring in federal funding. Um, next slide, please. The, the, um, the funds that we do bring in from the, um, from the uh, federal grants, as well as our um, state funding, is distributed in this area, and, and I was told that this is quite impressive because it shows diversity. So we we're not we don't have a single area of expertise. Um, we have a, a very balanced area um, distribution of expertise. Um, that's the, the main point of, the, of this slide. Um, ne next slide, please. One of the things I'm very proud of uh, is our. Uh, um, applied side of, of the research, which is the flagship of a, one of the flagships of our institute, is the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center. It is a NIOSH Center of Excellence on Total Worker Health. It's one of ten in the, in the country, 
um, and it's funded uh, by NIOSH, and it has now had three, three five-year cycles funded. So it got funded last year for another five years. It's been going for 11, year, uh, 11 years now. So um, this, this is really a, a fantastic resource for Oregon, um, and I, I believe we'll be presenting on that next time uh, we present to the, to the board. Next slide, please. Apart from MLAC um, and apart from NIH, which reviews all of, all of our grants and all of the peer review for the, for the publications that, that we do, we do get in, input, lots of feedback from, from those sources, but we also have an external advisory board that helps us uh, uh, craft our mission uh, and refine it. Um, and there's representation actually from, from workers' compensation here. Sally Cohen is, is, on, is on the board. Uh, Lou Savage is on the board. Um, Michael Wood used to be on the on the board, and and we we may uh, we hopefully will have will have um, in, input from Oregon OSHA on our board in the near future. Next slide, please. This slide just shows uh, just six examples from our from our blog page of recent achievements from our institute. Top left left hand one is one of those I mentioned earlier. It's a, the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center received a, a great news that we got another five years of support for, for that from from NIOSH. Um, that is essential to, for us to do that. It's very very competitive. The next slide I'm a little bit embarrassed to point out. It is um, an outstanding investigator award to me. <laughs> um, but the reason it, 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 it's a notable achievement is because. Um, it's a seven-year award, and um, it didn't go with, come with specific aims. It's, a, it's an award to an investigator based on the trust that the NIH has, has, has in that investigator. Uh, they don't want to waste, in, in this case, my time writing grant applications, which might take a month per application, and, and instead will fund my research program for the next seven years. Um, so that's a, a highlight of my career. Um, uh, next is uh, one down is Dr. Surat Thosar received a grant of $2.97 million from NHLBI. Um, I call that $3 million, but he calls it $2.97 million. Um, and um, on, on the, on the right-hand side, the uh, top right is uh, very proud of Dee Dee Montgomery from our outreach team. She uh, last year received the uh, American Society for Safety Professionals Region 10 Professional of the Year, Safety Professional of the Year Award. Uh, next one down is Leslie Hammer received the Oregon OHSU Distinguished Faculty Award for research. So sh showing that um, across OHSU, which is 18,000 employees, one of our institute, which is only 70 employees, received the, the highest uh, honor in research across our institute. Um, so with that, I would like to go to the next slide and ask if there are any questions. I should say that there are three more presentations to come, two on research, which will be about five to 10 minutes each, and another one on outreach. Uh, we can also ask, uh, um, answer questions at the end if you wish, but if there, this might be a convenient time to stop and if there, ask if there are any questions. I do not see any hands raised from my view, so. Okay, uh, yeah, I was gonna say. Yep, I, I, I'm keeping track of that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any, any other any questions going again for the folks virtually? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to move on. Oh, so oh, to Steve, uh, Professor Wood. Right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to present a portion of our work. The story that I'll be telling you is a compilation of about 15 years worth of research down to a five minute presentation. Um, the journey began with basic research that involved cancer and the origins of cancer, and it's now led to potentially designing new strategies for preventing obesity. And so on the next slide, um, I would just like to review with you some of the uh, really important features of uh, worldwide obesity, but most specifically focusing in the U.S. 
uh, for adult obesity, uh, the numbers are best estimated by the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the NIDDK. These are all numbers from them. Uh, the prevalence is uh, approaching or potentially even excess of 40% of the adult population. This represents a 50% increase from uh, the year 2000. Uh, it's equally distributed uh, among uh, men and women, and it is affecting all ethnicities. One of the truly alarming parts of their data collection has to do with childhood obesity, which is now in excess of 20%. Uh, of children in the U.S. This represents a 400% increase from just 1980. And so uh, addressing uh, the obesity epidemic and the confounding uh, other secondary diseases associated with that uh, is a major area of research interest. The next slide. So this significantly impacts uh, worker compensation claims. Uh, the data that I'm showing you is a, a compilation of a published work out of Duke University covering 12,000 individuals. Um, and to just kind of summarize for this particular study, which I believe is probably well represented uh, in a number of other studies in states, uh, is that uh, the obese worker will likely file approximately two times the number of claims that the cost of those claims is approximately seven times greater, and uh, the number of work days that are lost uh, due to uh, an injury uh, in the Duke study was 13 times higher for uh, obese workers versus the, the non. And also in terms of for obese workers in the high risk jobs, uh, these by far uh, comprise the highest medical and economic cost. And so, on the advance, so uh, our laboratories uh, did not intentionally begin uh, working in obesity, but we have discovered a new mechanism uh, that is very germane uh, to the onset of obesity and this is, in fact, given us clues on how to counter that. In the next slide, it came in a very surprising uh, fashion in which we uh, discovered that one of the key genetic regulators of obesity is, in fact, DNA repair. This is, uh, was not anticipated by any uh, of the investigators in the field. And basically, what DNA repair is is shown in the upper left hand where the, the DNA which is uh, in, found in your cells on a daily basis undergoes damage, which is indicated in the middle. If you have stress, if you have uh, inflammation, and a variety of, of other things can lead to DNA damage, and this is occurring in every cell in, uh, continuously throughout your lifetime. And what the cell has is multiple mechanisms by which you can repair that back to the normal state. The next clip. However, what we did was that we uh, then inactivated just a single gene, one of the DNA repair pathways, and what resulted, and we did this deletion in uh, a mouse model, and in the lower left-hand side of the slide, you see two brothers. Uh, these are litter mates. They were raised in the same cage. They had everything absolutely identical. However, the one on the left, uh, we had inactivated uh, one of its DNA repair genes, and the one on the right uh, shows a, a wild-type mouse. And as you can see, that uh, even on a very low-fat diet, uh, the mouse on the left becomes extremely heavy, is it averaging around 50 grams, while his brother is only about 30. As you would expect, as shown on the right, that there's a very significant increase uh, in the fat mass in these mice. That's clear. And so what we had learned was that if decreasing DNA repair leads to obesity, then we asked the question, what if we enhance DNA repair? Next slide. And in fact, this is a, a summary in which we again use genetic engineering in order to be able to increase the efficiency of DNA repair in a mouse. And so what is shown on the left is the weight gain 
for mice that are being put on a 60% fat diet, and that under nor if the mouse is a normal uh, mouse, that it increases from a little bit over 20 grams to over 50 grams. This is around a 250% increase in body weight only over 12 weeks. However, for those mice, and again, these are litter mates of one another, so everything is identical, those in which we were able to enhance repair uh, showed uh, a couple of gram increase being on a 60% fat diet over that 12 weeks. And as probably many of you know that obesity and metabolic syndrome are associated with a disease called fatty liver disease. And on the right-hand side, in the top portion of that picture, what happens is that during obesity, that you get a lot of fat accumulation in your liver, and that's shown by these kind of clearing or white areas. Uh, this was a, a tissue from one of the mice which had gained a considerable amount of weight. But then the litter mate, uh, looking at that liver, uh, is completely pristine if we increase the DNA repair. So in the next click. So our, uh, obviously, we cannot be genetically, as we engineer these mice, we can't engineer humans, and so we've taken an alternative strategy. And on the next slide, we're taking a pharmacological approach in order to identify chemicals uh, that would be, in fact, increasing DNA repair with the anticipation that if we can do pharmacologically what we did genetically, uh, that this would potentially be a, a, a strategy for combating obesity. And we have now, uh, the approach that we use is what is a high throughput drug screening, uh, and also we use artificial intelligence design in order to discover molecules that will take your normal DNA repair rates and rapidly uh, increase them. And what we have already been able to show over the last uh, about year and a half is that we have gone through these screens and the diagram on the left uh, uh, with the black bar shows a normal rate of DNA repair when we take selected of these chemicals and add that to uh, uh, these enzymes we can increase their rate by about eightfold. We're currently optimizing these uh, for preclinical studies. The really good thing about this is that uh, we have gotten a lot of interest from uh, the pharma industry and I think that they uh, are, are buying into this and so in addition to our NIH funding that there is interest from tech transfer uh, outside. The other thing is that the, there are applications beyond obesity. I haven't had time to show you but in the mice that are DNA repair deficient, they become insulin resistant and pre-diabetic. Those that are then engineered to have increased levels of repair are absolutely resistant uh, to developing insulin resistance. And we also have been able to demonstrate that there is evidence that this uh, approach may also be helpful in preventing neurodegeneration as characterized by Alzheimer's uh, and Parkinson's disease. And with that, I'll uh, be happy to take any questions uh, from the virtual, uh, the remote audience, or people in person. I don't see any hands raised. No questions. Oh, nope, actually, I'll pay it off. As I say, I think, yes, yeah, Sarah and Matt. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know who went first, Matt. We haven't heard from you today. Do you, do you have a question? I would uh, just Seeking a little clarification, so this process is for prevention of obesity. Is there any data suggesting that um, there's the potential for reversal or the treatment of existing obesity uh, going this route? Uh, that's a really excellent question. Um, by in the models that we have developed, which are using uh, genetic manipulation in the mice that uh, we have not yet completed it, but we are designing uh, and creating mice in which we would allow a mouse to begin uh, uh, gaining a lot of weight on a high fat diet, and then to use a mechanism to then turn on and increase the DNA repair within these. So uh, it's an excellent question. 
uh, we're experimentally approaching this. Uh, one of the target uh, human populations that is uh, potentially a, uh, a, a candidate for this is the individuals who are put on antipsychotic medications uh, that there is a portion of those individuals who within a year will gain 100 pounds or more. And so this is very predictable. Uh, and so this would potentially be a, a test population once, uh, if we can ever create the drugs through uh, uh, many, many years probably from now, trying to, to work on that. But this would be an ideal population in which you would be able to have individuals with relatively stable weight going on a medication which is going to uh, result in a known increase. And they would be a, a particular first-line uh, target population. Excellent question. And so it's, it's my understanding that you've done genetic uh, process in animal models, but you have not attempted a pharmacological in animal models yet either? No, at this point, uh, we're early enough in the identification and refinement of these small molecules uh, that we are now at a third generation in which we are interested in the pharmacologic properties of these chemicals. Uh, we'll need to look at their uh, half-life within a test organism. We'll need to look at how they are being turned over, whether there are any adverse side effects. Uh, so it's delivery mechanism and all. a very, very long process. But it would be turning to a, a, a strategy which had previously just been overlooked. And in fact, in my field, in the DNA repair field, other laboratories around the world uh, had also made this observation but never reported it where they would knock out a DNA repair gene and see obesity. And I was talking to one of the directors of a very large uh, cancer institute in Japan and uh, asked him about this and he said, yeah, they get fat, but I run a cancer institute, I don't care. And so it was just that sort of, uh, uh, we followed what the research was telling us and has led us very far from where we started, but we think that uh, especially doing uh, the, the work I didn't have time to show is that there are also uh, models in mice where the mice just never will stop feeding, and so there's a particular strain. And those mice get almost twice as big as the one that I showed you in that picture, and we've essentially been able to prevent obesity in that model also. So that we have both a diet-induced obesity and a genetic predisposition to obesity that have both been reversed. Great. And I, I know Sarah had a hand up as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It's um, nice to see that progress in this um, area that challenges us in the United States uh, specifically. But my question is time frame. Right? You alluded to many years out, um, but do you have any thought of when human trials could start? Um, the, the process and the cost for bringing a drug to market is um, uh, truly astronomical. And so currently, the, uh, the company, the major company that we're working with uh, is, is devoting all of their resources to this. I would say that we are easily more than a decade out before there would be uh, where you would go through all of the FDA processes for this, all of the, uh, the preclinical studies which are done in at least two animal species before this would be brought to any kind of human clinical trial. So uh, in other work in our laboratory in which we are working toward preventing uh, sunlight induced skin cancers, uh, we have been on that road for roughly 10 years and it is just now getting to the point where uh, uh, the first clinical trials we hope to begin next year. I mean, yeah. Matt has a question. Oh, uh, Matt, again? That, uh, the 
kind of reminded me when, when asking about how long out this is, and obviously with medical research it can be decades, I recently read an article um, by a professor from I think University of Virginia, and I'm just curious if there's any, uh, any way that this stuff overlaps with um, like Mediterranean diet, which I know it sounds like it would be a medication so people wouldn't necessarily have to adjust diet, but uh, a lot of the discussion around the Mediterranean diet was the decrease in inflammation and genetic um, damage that happens with our American diet. And if you look at the more, you know, whole foods, high fiber and whatnot. So I'm curious if, if you see the same results from um, those dietary changes on that genetic level of repair, or if you've even looked into it. And then I'll refrain from any more questions I could, you know, just not necessarily <laughs> Well, I, again, uh, a very, very insightful question. So, in fact, the DNA repair gene that we uh, took away and have now enhanced is, in fact, involved in the repair of damage that is caused by uh, inflammation. And, in fact, uh, you are absolutely correct to make the correlation between uh, various diets are uh, more inflammation prone and in inducing than other diets and therefore um, I, I think that even though the, uh, the line has not been fully connected that there is a lot of evidence pointing to uh, inflammation and induction of reactive oxygen species. Those uh, that type of damage damages uh, proteins in your cells, lipids, and DNA. And so what we believe is that the lipids and proteins are rapidly turned over. Uh, we gotta take care of our DNA. And if we don't take care of it, there are gonna be consequences. And so uh, I think that your correlation and uh, you know, putting a Mediterranean-like diet that would be uh, uh, reducing inflammation versus a pro-inflammatory diet um, is, is an excellent correlation and it would be in very close agreement with the data that we have. We've knocked out other DNA repair genes in the, uh, that also participate in the repair of uh, uh, infl inflammatory induced damage and those mice also become obese. So we have not done the correlation by then enhancing those. No more questions from the squares. Yeah, no more questions. Thank you so much. So it was sorry, fascinating. No, 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 that's great. Thank you. Good morning. I'm um, Dr. Nicole Bowles. I'm an assistant professor within the institute, and I will be briefly discussing the impact of work schedules on firefighter health. Next slide, please. Um, but first, I would like to provide a brief overview of my developing program. Um, I'm interested in the interactions between stress, which I look at broadly. So thinking about both psycho, um, psychological stress, so that includes like workplace um, stress or job strain and levels of discrimination. Um, but then also thinking about environmental stressors. So if I'm thinking about firefighters, maybe thinking about the levels of noise, what are the consequences of getting light at night. Um, and then also somatic stressors, so um, the, the words are a bit small there, but that says like, exercise, fatigue, and pain. Um, whenever I say exercise as a stress, people are um, always you know, ask, well, isn't that a, a beneficial health behavior? Well, it depends, right? You can certainly push yourself too hard. Um, but then also for those that really don't want to exercise, it can also be a stressor. Um, so it's thinking about ways of, of uh, developing a program that fits an individual. Um, but then also thinking about how do those how can we attenuate or or maybe exacerbate the stress depending on those health behaviors. So looking at the um, circle on the left, the risk factors again that can be positive health behaviors like sleeping or negative um, potentially maybe cannabis use. That's uh, a question there. We don't have enough just the data to really definitively say what is the best form of use. Is it actually beneficial? Um, and then on the right, things that are out of our control. So thinking about age and race, um, how are those impacting stress? Um, on the bottom, thinking about, again, uh, for firefighters, maybe thinking about the time of day something might happen. Again, what is the consequence of experiencing a traumatic event at night when your body is primed to sleep versus during the daytime? And then 
what are the consequences of all those things on cardiometabolic health outcomes? The story doesn't end there, and that's why it's a full and circle. Um, part of my work is more um, on the uh, behavioral cardiology side of things. So, for example, if you're diagnosed with hypertension, that is a big, that can be a big stress in your life. You have to change health behaviors that maybe you've you know, had your entire early adulthood, and suddenly you have to fit in a medication, again, develop an exercise program that works, change your diet, and so that can be a big um, uh, change in your life. So it's really a full on circle. Um, next slide, please. My work with firefighters um, fits in there nicely. Um, they um, were specifically uh, the Wellness Committee from Portland's Fire Union came to us in 2018 with the question of what is the best work schedule or what are the consequences of different work schedules on our health. And when discussing with them a bit further, it became clear that that was an interest because of increased call volume. So if you look on the graph on the right, you'll see um, Portland Fire and Rescue, their number of overall calls over the last 10 years um, with the um, gray line with the asterisk. Um, and that, those level of calls, which have increased, um, again, in the last 10 years relevant to 2008, um, is paralleled by the number of calls nationally. Um, similarly, if you look at the, over number, the overall number of firefighters, so the number of full-time FTE, um, Portland's in red, and the national levels in blue, you see the number of overall firefighters has not changed at all. So we have no change in firefighters, but an increase in call. Obviously, you're going to have an increase in workload for most firefighters. That means increased occupational burden, so that might be more traditional exposures to chemicals or lifting heavy items, but that also now means less opportunities to sleep on the job, and so increases in sleep loss. Next slide, please. Going back to the question of uh, Portland's Wellness Committee, what is the best schedule? Well, at the time, they were working at 24-48, so that's one day on, two days off, one day on, two days off, one day on. And when conducting focus groups with um, them, again, it became clear that sleep loss was having a big impact, not just on their on the job, but also at home. This is, um, here, next slide, please. Showing a representative quote, um, again, this was hours of focus groups, so just showing here one quote of um, hundreds of this theme, but thousands of quotes in general. Um, you go home and you're not well rested. And you're asked, where are we going to dinner tonight? And it seems like such an insignificant question. But that's when a lot of people shut down. And they just don't talk. And what's important to your significant other, you don't care about. Then that creates some tension, which goes a lot of different directions like divorce. Next slide, please. So are alternative schedules the question? And there are many um, different schedules. But the overall theme is that they're increasing the number of consecutive days off, such here as the one, three, two, three, so change the connotation, but that's what's used. Um, so one day on, three days off, two days on, three days off. Um, but in addition to the trade-off, or as a trade-off of the additional time off, you see that there's additional time on. So is this a better uh, alternative? Next slide, please. Focus groups uh, with individuals that are currently working the one, three, two, three schedule suggest that it is. Um, based on this representative quote, I'm definitely not as short of my kids. You get off shift, and even if it was on the second day, your kids would do something that were mildly irritating, and you would just, at least I would just go off the deep end. And I'm way, way better than I was six months ago before the schedule change. And with that being said, I'm more involved with my kids than I was six months ago. Like right now, I coach both of my kids' basketball teams, which is like every day, three to four hours after school, and I still feel great. Uh, we also did surveys um, as part of a pilot study with firefighters um, that were part of the study for at least two weeks, some of them um, up to six weeks, and uh, we provided surveys on work family conflict for both firefighters and their significant other, and consistent with this quote, we saw that work-life conflict did decrease um, with increasing time off, but with increasing time on, so going back to that 48-hour shift, work family conflict got worse. So again, overall, what is the best schedule? Next slide, please. So at the moment, we're funded by um, the through the Oregon Healthy Workforce Center as part of the Total Worker Health um, Match, just Total Worker Health Program, to study this exact question on a larger scale. So at the moment, we're prospectively studying Portland Fire and Rescue, who has made that transition to that one three two three schedule in March. So in January, February, we collected baseline data before this shift change, um, did an acute assessment in May and June, and then at the end of the year, we'll be um, doing uh, repeating measurements as well. Um, these are cardiovascular sleep, um, stress, um, again, getting that work-family conflict, 
um, and then I hope to present to them uh, at the beginning of the year before they make a vote on whether to stay with the 1323 or go back to the 2448. Um, and then we're generally, we're doing a cross-sectional study um, to look at departments um, across the state um, who are working either 2448 or 1323. Um, so that's included like Eugene or Canby. Um, and if you have any other suggestions of partners, um, we'd love to have them. Um, and yeah, I hope to come back in future years and present those uh, findings of that full-on study. Next slide. Thank you, and any questions, please? Do you have any questions virtually from folks? Matt. Matt? Of course I do. Yes, this is, this is Matt Galsby with Oregon <laughs> Nurses Association. So I have to ask, um, will, will nurses be included in that uh, healthcare worker group that you mentioned that would be studied? Um, and then, you know, a lot of that resonated with me. I did uh, ICU night shifts for quite a while, 12 hour shifts, and I still pick up call for the cath lab, and I'll have weekends where um, a lot of interrupted sleep and a lot of stress. So. I think it would be great to see this work also expand out to nursing and as you're affiliated with OHSU, you have a large population to work with, so it would be great to see that. Yeah, for sure. So this study is specifically just for firefighters in part because they are living in the workplace, so that provides a, a different dynamic as well. But I do have a colleague um, through the School of Nursing um, who is um, also has an appointment in the Institute and he is doing some uh, work with the nurses. Okay, we have Marcy, then Margaret. Oh, uh, Marcy? Hi, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm with um, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 125, and we represent members who work in the utility industry, um, so both our utilities, line clearance, tree trimming, and uh, contractors. And I just wanted to say that information you provided just resonated with me because they don't really um, when you showed the graph that indicated the number of FTEs versus the number of calls, that's exactly what we're facing in our industry. So just wanted to say thank you, and I hope you uh, include some linemen while you're at it. Yeah, that would have been love to work yeah, with you. Okay, Margaret. Uh, Margaret? Uh, thank you. It's a fascinating presentation. I'm wondering if there is an organization or a portion of your organization that is looking at the outcomes. For example, if someone has been working for 24 hours and has to make a critical decision versus um, someone who has worked 48 hours without sleep and has to make a critical decision. Yeah, so we are doing measurements that um, get to that. So one item that um, uh, they'll complete every day in the morning and at night is called a psychomotor vigilance task. And so it seems pretty simple. You just push a button and um, we're looking at a state attention. Um, but yeah, it gets at the question of performance. Um, and then we also do um, collect data subjectively um, to try to get at that. And then we also have access to accident reports. I'm just waiting a moment to see if anybody else will raise their hand. I think we we are good. Okay, yeah, and and just from my perspective as well, I think this is invaluable research. Um, as we move into a, a different kind of economy, increasingly from what we've had over the last, I mean, even a few decades, let alone hundreds or thousands of years. Um, I, I know that I've worked a 410 schedule before and have seen the impact that that has on my life, my livelihood, my wellness, my ability to do things with my family compared to other schedules. Um, and, and I think it's really exciting to see that there's a lot of real critical analysis and, 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 and amazing research being done um, on the impacts of this so that we can kind of rethink that as we move forward and, and see, um, you know, with, with technology change and, and the issues that we have to deal with now, uh, how can we better structure that? So I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing on that. Thank you, and thank you for your questions.
delighted to be in this new role, and I think creating this new role really uh, exemplifies the Institute's commitment to outreach. Next slide, please. So I work with a terrific team at the Institute, and our job is really to convert the research um, of the faculty into practice, and to then disseminate that research and the findings and the products that result from the research um, to appropriate stakeholders. And we do this through three primary mechanisms, communication and dissemination, practitioner education and training, and implementation partnerships. And what I want to do is briefly describe each of those uh, planks of our outreach strategy. I'm new in the role. I've been sort of assessing um, how we're working, and I will be elevating a lot of this work in the coming months uh, and year. Next slide, please. Um, so the first plank of our outreach strategy really is pure communication and dissemination. We work very hard to get our information out into the marketplace, as I said, the marketplace of ideas, which, as we know, is extremely crowded these days. Um, we have a terrific woman on our team, Helen Shuckers, and she has really built out our social media platforms. Uh, we have a blog, a newsletter, we do podcasts. And as you can see by the numbers on the screen, we are viewed as a trusted source of information. We get a lot of likes, a lot of listens, um, and people do return again and again uh, to tap into the information that we provide. Next slide, please. Um, the second plank of our uh, outreach strategy is practitioner education and training. The Institute has an explicit commitment to educating practitioners in the occupational health, safety, and wellness field, and we do this in two primary ways. On average, we hold three uh, conferences or symposia each year, and these are the traditional conference model where people come and attend. Historically, they've been in person. They've been virtual for the last couple of years to learn from experts in the field, both regional experts and national experts. Um, these are low-cost events that are highly attended, um, and we try to be very topical. So for example, the last two symposia have been on uh, the impact of climate change on occupational health and safety. Uh, last month, we held a symposia uh, with the title The Great Resignation, looking at why people are so unhappy at work and why so many people are leaving their jobs during the time of COVID. I want to highlight what we call total worker health, and Steve Shea uh, described what that is earlier, and it's the focus of the Oregon Healthy Workforce uh, Center. Next slide, please. Total worker health is a holistic uh, approach to occupational uh, safety and health that really includes psychosocial psycho stressors in addition to sort of physical safety in the workplace. We have a unique Alliance in Oregon. I believe it is the only statewide alliance where we have partnered in a formal way with SAFE and Oregon OSHA to advance total worker health, to disseminate it broadly, and institutionalize the set of practices associated with total worker health. Um, Dee Dee Montgomery on our team and Liz Hill of SAFE have developed a total worker health curriculum ranging from uh, total Worker Health Basics 101, um, all the way to very specific, more technical courses. And I will say that the demand for Total Worker Health training has been off the charts. There's incredible demand for this information. Liz and Dee Dee cannot actually fulfill and meet all of the demand for these courses, so they've developed a Train the Trainer curriculum, which they're delivering currently. We're also developing a certificate program in Total Worker Health uh, with the University of Washington. So I will really be thinking about how we build from this um, clear demand for information about total worker health as we move forward. Next slide, please. The final plank of our outreach um, strategy is what we call implementation partnerships with employers. And this is, I think, an area where we really like to work with DCBS and think about how we get the information the tools and the training that come out of our applied research specifically into the hands of those workers and employers who can benefit from this information. So if you think about the work that Nicole is doing, 
once she has conclusions from her research, how do we push that out? How do we make sure that every fire department in the state of Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, has access to this information and data in ways that's really usable for them? And again, that's that research into practice, right? It's two different languages often, and so we have to think hard about how we translate the research and move it to practice. Our applied researchers develop products, trainings, and tools um, associated with all of their work. Next slide, please. And what we need to do is think carefully and strategically about how we get that work, again, into the hands of people who can use it. One example is our COMPASS uh, toolkit, Community of Practice and Safety Support. So one of our faculty, Ryan Olson, developed um, a study in partnership with the Oregon Home Care Commission to really look at how to improve the working conditions for home care workers who are subject to isolation and the psychosocial stressors that go along with that, as well as the physical injury that can result from having to you know, do the physical work of caring for other humans. Um, this is an evidence-based toolkit that uh, Dr. Olson developed and has now been adopted by the Oregon Home Care Commission and is available to 60% of all home care workers in the state of Oregon. But again, if it's relevant in Oregon, it's relevant in the state of Washington, and it's relevant nationally. And so really what we're looking at, I think, with the outreach function is, is one, recognizing that remarkable work is going on in this institute and we want to push it out, and we want to push it out in ways that are user-friendly, uh, accessible, and easy for workers and employers to tap into. Um, so that concludes our uh, varied presentation, and next slide, I'm happy also to take any questions or to follow up with folks um, if there's interest in you know, further discussion. Do we have any questions virtually? I'm going to give it a moment. No. Thank you. Nothing? Yeah, thank you so much. So it looks like next on the agenda we have the National Council on Compensation Insurance Overview. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Todd Johnson with the NCCI. Thank you uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Uh, spend a few minutes regarding um, NCCI and our role in the Oregon workers' compensation system. So, uh, Brittany, can you tee up the uh, PowerPoint? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Todd Johnson, I've been in the uh, work comp industry uh, 35 years now, about 30 of those years were leading uh, carriers and uh, third party administrators for um, operations in both the claims and policy arena, and then five years with the, with the NCCI in this role as a senior state relations executive. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about uh, NCCI. We are the licensed rating organization in Oregon and 35 other jurisdictions. We operate as a nonprofit and are primarily funded uh, by a percentage of the work comp premium uh, that's in the work comp marketplace. So currently, we receive about 60 cents for every $100 of premium. We were founded in 1923 and we'll be celebrating our 100 year anniversary uh, in next year in 2023. Here's a kind of list of our primary products and services for the industry. Annually, we file the recommended loss costs and assigned risk rates with the Oregon Division of Financial Regulation for their consideration and, and potential approval. We maintain the basic manual, the, the classification system, and many of the industry's workers' compensation forms. We conduct uh, inspections uh, across the country, and specifically uh, thousands of inspections in Oregon each year. 
so that we are trying to verify that the 700 plus class codes are being properly assigned uh, by employers across the country and the industry. We also manage the experience rating program, otherwise known as uh, EMODs. And therefore, we calculate the experience mods for companies uh, throughout, throughout the state and, uh, and countrywide as well. And then finally, the last bullet on the top portion of the slide is discussing a little bit about the residual market. Residual market is the market of last resort uh, for employers that are unable to obtain workers' compensation coverage in the voluntary market. We manage that program in Oregon as well as about 24 other states. In Oregon, there are about 5,000 employers in the residual market with premium of about $20 million. That represents just under 4% of the market share. So that's 4% of the insured market share. That would not the 4% of the total for a comp market in Oregon because we're not including any self-insured in that statistic. So we've actually seen about a 10% drop in the number of policies and about a 15% drop in the number of uh, in the amount of the residual market premium in Oregon on a year-over-year -year basis. So either these uh, employers are able to find coverage in the voluntary market, or uh, we may have employers that have simply gone out of business and withdrew uh, from the market as, as a whole. So um, again, about a 10% drop in residual market uh, policies um, on a year-over-year -year basis. So we collect data from about 800 different insurance carriers, which include the state funds. And we use that data to file uh, our loft costs, assign risk rates, repair research, and other thought leadership um, uh, publications. Our goal with the uh, legislative impact analysis is to evaluate the system, reform, and technically support the legislative process. So we are trying to uh, provide you as policymakers with objective information so that they, you can uh, provide some informed decisions, uh, understand the potential impact of your decisions on the work comp system. We do not advocate for any bill for or against. So it's, um, you know, we're, we're taking a neutral position, but just trying to provide, a, a, trying to quantify value of that decision on the overall uh, work comp system. Just as an example, um, I did provide um, our recent analysis of HB 4138, um, understanding that this um, bill does a lot more than just maybe just change benefits. So we had an, uh, a, a summary uh, analysis indicating that it was an indeterminate increase. There was a ex slight expansion of benefits. So it's really difficult to quantify that into a specific dollar value. Um, because behavior of an injured employee will, will contribute to um, utilization of those benefits. If, however, we have uh, a medical fee schedule change or a change in permanency value or a change in the extension of uh, temporary total, total benefits, those types of legislative changes uh, are much more easier to quantify, and then our analysis would then uh, reflect that accordingly, giving you uh, a specific value and dollar amount in the uh, impact for the Oregon work comp system. Next slide, please. This is where we operate. Uh, the dark blue states represent uh, those states where NCCI is the designated um, rating organization or statistical organization. Um, the light blue states are the independent bureaus. So there's nine independent bureaus across the country. We do partner with these independent bureaus and some of the bureaus actually um, uh, utilize NCCI services. And that could be um, our basic manuals, it could be residual market plan administration, uh, could be classification system. So um, there is a strong uh, partnership between the independent bureaus and NCCI in those states where we are not the 
designated rating organization uh, in the other in the other states. And then, of course, uh, there are still four um, monopolistic states: uh, Washington, Wyoming, North Dakota, and Ohio. Uh, we certainly monitor what's happening in those states. They stay connected with us, uh, but we do not uh, make any filings in those monopolistic states. Next slide, please. This is just representing uh, uh, the, the breadth of data that we receive. Um, you know, there's 5.4 million unit stat reports. Um, you know, uh, 27 billion dollars of uh, premium, 11.7 uh, million in indemnity data call, um, 61.5 million uh, different medical transactions. So. Uh, it just gives you a, a, a sense of the depth of data that we do receive on a countrywide basis, and it means that we have the most complete data set available within the workers' compensation industry um, on, a, on a national basis. Next slide, please. Just uh, uh, resources uh, that we have available on our website, ncci.com. Um, there's a tremendous amount of resources within our industry and even within Oregon, of course. Um, our focus is generally uh, countrywide with some state-specific information as well. We do a lot of thought leadership through our actuarial and economic services teams. Um, following legislative trends and we're doing a lot of research on our data to identify um, what the drivers are within the work comp industry and then reporting that back out to industry. And more recently, we've, we've done some uh, analysis on motor vehicle accidents, uh, work comp catastrophes, and then the impact of wage inflation on the, on the work comp systems. I'm gonna touch on uh, the COVID-19 information in a little bit. <laughs> And then I would also just remind um, that we do have a, um, a learning center available as well. Uh, a lot of this is available to the public. You don't need to be a, a, an affiliate or have a subscriber um, ID. Um, just a lot of general uh, workers' compensation industry uh, information. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you one example of uh, some ongoing uh, research and tools that we have available. This is our medical indicators and trends dashboard. And again, this is um, open. Anybody can log in and, and take a look at this at any time. Um, we started this um, at the time of the pandemic um, in 2020, as we started to track the behavior of injured employees um, benefit utilization, medical utilization, and uh, COVID-19 claims. And so what this dashboard does is it tracks um, uh, medical services, hospital services, physician services, um, a variety of things um, on a quarter by quarter basis over, um, over the last three years. Um, and again, this is just a, a one report and one snapshot but um, this screenshot just kind of highlighting the hospital outpatient data based on fourth quarter of 2021 data. But here we see that in Oregon, uh, the number of hospital outpatient visits per 1,000 claims remains uh, elevated as compared to a countrywide data. However, if we look at the cost or the average pay per visit, uh, that remains uh, fewer or lower than the countrywide payments. So um, again, this is just a, a snapshot of one data point to give you an example of the type of uh, data analysis and reporting that we're providing to the industry um, with the data that's being collected. Next slide, please. There was a request I touched a little bit on the COVID-19 uh, resources. And so um, there's a lot. <laughs> But I just wanted to um, highlight a couple of things, uh, our role in the, in the, in the work comp system and, and COVID-19. Um, so after the pandemic started, uh, within a matter of weeks, um, NCCI provided resources to help manage the impact to the industry. 
we made uh, filings in uh, 36 states to help mitigate the impact to both the employers and the employees. For example, um, for COVID-19 claims, we excluded them from uh, experience rating, so an employer wouldn't have their experience rating um, worsened as a result of their employees contracting COVID-19 and filing a claim. And we also excluded all COVID-19 claims from our annual uh, rate-making perspective uh, for our loss costs and our assigned risk rates because we believe that this COVID-19 pandemic is more of a catastrophe and is not predictive of future um, activity within our um, work uh, environment. And then we um, worked with all the states as well to make sure that um, if an employer um, uh, furloughed an employee but was still paying them, we could exclude all of that payroll from the employer's work comp premium. So that they had somebody um, that was sent home, but they kept paying them. Uh, because there was no exposure, we ensured through the regulatory efforts that they wouldn't be charged premium for that. So. And more recently, in January of this year, we published the COVID-19 impact uh, report. And that is actually a multi-bureau report where we looked at um, the 36 states where NTCI operates, plus the uh, independent bureaus. Uh, and we were able to collect data then from just about every state in the country and produce this report. And we have ongoing uh, resources for the industry um, as we track what's happening on a legislative basis or presumption of benefits, um, as well as any um, rules and other regula regulations on a, on a state-by-state uh, -state basis. So i just give you the, the real um, high-level thumbnail sketch um, in Oregon. Uh, as we are preparing to file our next um, annual loss cost and assigned risk rate filing in, uh, in Oregon, um, we looked um, deeply at all of the Oregon experience for policy year uh, 2020 uh, because the most impactful piece of the COVID that's to the, the upcoming filing. We look at reported COVID-19 claims and the losses that would represent uh, less than a 2% share of the reported paid plus case losses in Oregon as a whole. Again, now that is, just as a reminder, that's uh, the insured values, that is, that does not include um, self-insureds. Uh, but it gives you um, a perspective that while there was a moderate impact to the work comp system in Oregon in 2020, policy year 2020, um, it was completely manageable um, uh, from, the, from the work comp uh, perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just most of the resources. Um, everything I've discussed today is available at these, is available at these links. I know we are, um, bumping up against the top of the hour, so I will uh, end my comments there. Next slide has my uh, contact information on it. Um, I'm certainly available for questions now or at any time, and I uh, look forward to continuing to partner with, uh, with the MR group. Do we have any questions from the virtual folks? I, I got a text from one of them saying that I think there was a connection issue, but that they're back in. Okay. Patrick has... I see Pat, or I, I hear Patrick. Yeah, Patrick, yes, he does. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was a raised hand. <laughs> yeah, I, I, hi there, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Justin, that was very interesting. I appreciated your, your uh, uh, presentation of COVID's impact in Oregon in particular. And I was curious if you were able to compare that to your uh, reporting of other states. Is Oregon more, less, average? Uh, so uh, I believe Oregon was a little bit less than uh, other states. If I recall, and I can uh, follow up with you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, the um, national perspective was about 6% and Oregon is around 2%, but I will uh, follow up and provide you with a um, more uh, uh, detailed answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I also had another question if, if it's all right. Certainly. Um, 
So my other question was uh, in terms of, so we are a body that is looking at proposed legislation and, and weighing different factors, and you said that you do support those initiatives. I was wondering, what sort of lead time does NCCI need, and who can ask for your research, and does it cost? There is no cost uh, to uh, ask for research from, uh, for a legislative analysis from NCCI, that is part of the services that we provide to the industry um, through the funding that we already receive. Um, typically, those um, requests will come through uh, the MLAC uh, chair um, or DCBS, and we are happy to provide that, that research. We typically need about um, two to three weeks to provide a full analysis, which during a legislative session can seem uh, ridiculously long because at the speed of which sometimes these bills are, are moved and, and, um, and, and condensed or changed. However, we can also um, provide what we call an express analysis, um, meaning that uh, within in less than a week, we can give you um, the back of the envelope type analysis that says, you know, if you want to increase benefits from 66 and two thirds to 80 percent, this is what the impact of the system will be. It will be an abbreviated analysis, and then once the legislation, um, we can either continue with the full analysis. Or once the legislation is enacted, we would we would complete the analysis. Thank you. My pleasure. Do we have any other questions virtually? I know uh, one question that I had. I saw in the presentation it said that the uh, insurance department designates uh, NCCI. Is is that by by statute or rule or practice? Uh, that is by statute. Okay. And then I, I think another question that I had too is, um, I know in the analysis, uh, I think we got an email that had two different, you know, it had the slideshow that you went through and then it had the HB 4138 analysis uh, workup that you've done. Uh, there was a lot of mention of the cost of the system. Uh, has, has NCCI done anything to uh, analyze sort of the cost on the worker side or, or the impacts? And, and I'll, I'll give you a brief example. So um, say if you, if you have a, a scenario where um, a worker is not then receiving benefits because they've, they've been uh, reduced, uh, even, even given the same exact scenario, if you have two different workers that aren't equally positioned, the cost incurred to the worker and their family may be substantially different. So if, if I have an on-the-job injury where there's a denial or, or there's a change in the law, um, it would be relatively comparably cheap for me to afford to just incur that cost myself uh, because of my access to, to credit on very favorable terms. Whereas a worker in, in a worse off scenario who would have to get a payday loan or, or do something more drastic uh, to cover that cost, there's obviously a huge economic difference or, or financial difference in those two scenarios. And I would argue similarly uh, for a, an insurer uh, compared to a smaller business or a larger business, um, that the cost because of the access to credit is going to change substantially. Is there Has there been much research or, or looking into uh, that as part of the, the lens or analysis that is done when costs would increase? Uh, we, thank you for the question. Um, my short answer is no. Um, so that's not currently the focus of NCCI research. Um, we are looking at um, more system-wide costs as compared to um, an individual um, employee um, cost. Now, we will look at things like um, impact of independent um, contractors, a gig economy, um, and that, but it is, again, it's, it's more of a, a broad brush about um, uh, where an independent contractor, gig, gig worker might not have access to benefits of a traditional employee. Um, so, and I would just follow that up, uh, that we do not receive any employee identifying information. So. When we receive these um, uh, this wealth of data that we receive from the carriers and state funds, 
Uh, we're not receiving any specific employee information, but um, our organization as a whole does not go down that level of detail to an individual employee. Right, and, and I think I was given an example of an individual employee. I think the, the concern or, or interest that I had was more if you, if you have a $5 million cost that's incurred by a statutory change or something, um, that the actual cost realized by a community or by a group is going to be different uh, based on their access and availability to credit. So that $5 million, yes, it may cost an insurance company or, or group of insurers or, or pool or something like that, roughly $5 million plus a little bit in admin fees. If you take that $5 million and you apply it to workers, especially low-income workers, it may end up resulting in 20 or $30 million in costs to them because of the lack of, of access to credit and other things. So I, I just, that's, that's something I think that's an interesting lens to look through as part of kind of a DEI analysis on when we look at costs, even system-wide costs, when they're spread to different uh, parties that have different availability to credit and, and economic situations. Um, so I was, I was curious if that was done at all, but I, I, I think you answered that. So thank you. Uh, I see Tammy's hand. Let's see. Yes, please. Hi. Hi, Todd. Nice to see you again. Thanks for the presentation. Um, kind of the same line of questions that Pat just had. Um, do you guys track it all like medical costs? The, the rising cost of medical is shocking. I would have an emergency room bill three years ago, $7,000. Now it's twenty-five thousand dollars for you know just a fall and a fractured collarbone. Twenty-five thousand dollar emergency room bill, uh, angle hernia surgery repair bill, outpatient surgery forty-two thousand dollars now. Uh, the cost of the procedures, medical procedures, it, it has just like astronomically increased. Do you guys track that at all? We, we do, and thank you for the question. And so there's two primary things that uh, reports I would, that I would point the um, uh, committee to. One is we annually, um, as uh, DCBS prepares changes to the medical fee schedule, we look at all of the uh, changes um, that are being proposed and, and all of the fee schedule um, values, and we prepare a report um, that shows the um, in increase to the system costs as a result of the increasing um, costs, specifically that are kind of within the medical fee schedule. Understand that there are um, medical services outside the medical fee schedule. We also produce a medical data report on an annual basis that is shared with DCBS that tracks um, uh, quite a number of medical costs. Um, whether that's ambulatory surgical centers or prescription benefits or ER visits, um, you know, the evaluation, medical treatment, um, all of those costs are tracked um, throughout uh, Oregon, and then we compare that both on a regional basis as, a com as well as a countrywide basis. And um, that report is um, pretty extensive, and we could probably make that available to you as well. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I would be interested in that report as well. I think that's interesting. Thank you. Any any other uh, virtual questions from folks? Great. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you again for the invitation. Appreciate it. So I think that is the all we have on the agenda. I just have two small items for the good of the order. Uh, number one, just showing this, actually, you can't see it because my, <laughs> my background is blurred. Um, the uh, DCPS has just recently published the latest edition of laws relating to workers' compensation and safe employment in Oregon. So members, we will, for Scott, we'll give it to you now. Uh, for the rest of you, we will send this to you. What this is is a compilation of... Um, a variety of chapters in through Oregon ORS, um, which not just workers' compensation, but for OSHA. So the Safe Worker, so the Safe Work Employment Act is included in that. Um, the Administrative Procedures Act, which um, covers um, administrative rule hearings. Um, 
or a statute specific to Boley and their jurisdiction over retaliation complaints for OSHA and workers' compensation aspects, such as filing a claim, um, and also a couple of other pieces of this. So again, we will send this to you shortly on that. Um, last but not least, of course, um, so this is probably more for stakeholders than members. Um, the the timeframes for the next round of executive appointments is coming quickly. Um, next Monday is the deadline for uh, policy advisors in the governor's office to make their thoughts, to give their thoughts on um, appointments to the governor's executive appointments team. So if you have information to pass along, please do so ASAP. And that includes myself in that as well. So that's all I've got, Mr. Co-Chair. Great. And anything else uh, get the order or other comments, concerns from members virtually? No, I think we can adjourn the meeting at this point. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.